Imagine if you could easily find solutions to make your region or city smarter, greener, better connected, more social, and closer to citizens. The InterAg Europe Policy Learning Platform can help you. Access knowledge about the latest policy trends. Discover expert validated good practices from all over Europe. Find solutions in our peer review. Get tailored support from our expert team. We can connect you with the right people and organizations. Together, we will find ways to solve your region's or city's challenges. Start your policy learning journey today. Hey everybody, welcome to this webinar by Interreg Europe Policy Learning Platform on the social dimension of agritourism. My name is Mark Deliste and I will be uh, the moderator today. And together with me is my colleague Eric and uh, Vladimir, who will help run this uh, event together with me. Um, maybe to share a few practical details that if you have any technical hiccups, then you can write uh, privately in the chat to do Policy Learning Platform, which is represented by Vladimir, who you also see on, on the screen currently, uh, because he can help you with any technical issues you might have. Um, otherwise, uh, we also encourage you to ask a lot of questions during the webinar. And for this, you can also use the chat function and the Q&A uh, tool on, on Zoom. Um, so we're going to have very exciting presentations today, and we hope that these will also spark uh, discussion and, and questions from your side. So please don't hesitate to use that opportunity. Um, otherwise, uh, we have quite a large attendance today. And as we are still in the beginning sort of, of the new programming period of Inter Europe, I would like to say a few words about what the policy learning platform is about, because um, not all of you might uh, still be aware. Um, but before I do that, I will still also go through the agenda. Um, so today's agenda, as, as already mentioned, we have uh, three presentations uh, that you probably saw when you were uh, signing up for this event. We have a keynote uh, from Eline, uh, bringing in a Belgian perspective, and uh, she was part of a brand tour project in Europe, which was uh, a project of the previous period. So they have some interesting uh, results or developments to share uh, ever since the project ended as well. Um, and then we have uh, two good practices from the Inter-Europe community coming from uh, Austria and Romania. And after each presentation, you have a chance to ask questions. And in the end, we also have a panel discussion and a wrap up, wrap up and conclusion session as well. But as promised, uh, a few words about inter Europe as such as well. So um, the policy learning platform is the second pillar of inter Europe. Um, so you might be part of a project in, in the, in the inter Europe world, but the platform is there to sort of valorize uh, the knowledge generated within projects bring it out of the silos and, and sort of uh, facilitate greater knowledge sharing. And, and what we do then is uh, we do these webinars that you're attending today. There are physical workshops. Uh, we write policy briefs, uh, stories and articles and so on that you can find on the Policy Learning Platform uh, website. Um, but also for you to know is that the Policy Learning Platform offers a tailored services to European regions. So basically all public authorities across Europe uh, can apply for these services that are free of charge. And the key word here is that they are tailored to your needs. So if in your region on almost any policy topic you have a challenge, then uh, you are free to turn to us to write to me or Eric and say that you're interested in, in getting some support. And then we can guide you through the process of how you can uh, apply for these services. Uh, maybe to mention just that it's not a competitive application round, it's really um, only an eligibility check, and then we already get into the details of how and, and in which time frame can we assist you. And on this slide, you can just see that um, in the last five years, we've implemented quite many peer reviews and matchmaking sessions across Europe. Uh, however, there are still some areas uh, on the map that are maybe not so populated with these little dots. Um, and if you're in, from one of these regions or countries, uh, maybe uh, it's an encouragement for you to also take a look at how, how your region could also benefit from these services. 
And in practice, what they do or what they're about is that in the case of the peer review, we would find across Europe five to six experts on this concrete topic or the challenge that you have. And we would come to your region for a day and a half uh, to discuss and propose uh, policy solutions on this particular topic. And the matchmaking session is similar, uh, but it's just a shorter format. So normally it's around two hours and that we do either virtually uh, or we do it uh, on the second day of one of our workshops. And just to sort of give you two concrete examples uh, from the past, so two years ago, we went to Korsula in Croatia and there was a topic on developing smart island tourism strategies. And together with experts from Estonia, Norway and Finland, uh, we discussed for, for a day and a half on how Korsula, um, you know, what type of initiatives could it take and, and how the strategy would be developed so that they would get the benefits um, that they, they want. Because this was a really an area that's highly um, seasonal with its tourism. And they were trying to, to think outside of the box and what they could do and also validate their ideas with these international experts. And uh, more recently, just an example of this matchmaking service uh, in, in Burgos uh, this uh, May, uh, we, we discussed for two hours on co-working areas in rural areas of Latvia. And again, we had experts from Estonia, Sweden, and Finland around the table uh, sharing their best practices and examples and giving advice uh, to colleagues from Latvia. Um, so that's in a nutshell how these services look like. Um, you can find more about them on our website. And as already said, uh, both me and Eric are always uh, very approachable. We can set up a separate meeting to discuss these services uh, further uh, with you. As well as our other colleagues in the team, uh, because Eric and, and I, we represent the Social Europe a team of Interreg Europe. Um, however, we have colleagues also under Smarter, Greener, uh, and other uh, sub areas uh, of the program. Uh, so you might also have this meeting with somebody else if you are focusing on, let's say, sustainability uh, in your tourism sector or, or something else. But uh, now um, we are here today to discuss uh, agritourism and just sort of, I have two slides to sort of set the scene in a way. So how we understand agritourism is, is, is basically something that combines the elements of agriculture and tourism or, or sometimes let's say the food sector and tourism in, in a broader way. And the idea is really to offer uh, sort of uh, ways for the visitors then to engage either with farming practices or with rural areas or, or, or with the food directly. And um, sometimes agritourism is also seen as an opportunity to bring the urban and rural communities more closer. Um, locally, uh, at least it tends to encourage uh, collaboration and, and community building uh, between different stakeholders. Uh, also, the wish there is also to diversify the local tourism offer. So if you put, bring together an agricultural um, provider and, and uh, the tourism industry like an accommodation uh, provider, then the idea is that by bringing these stakeholders together, you might come up with some new interesting um, tourism services uh, for the region, which are beneficial then both economically and, and socially. Uh, and uh, for these local stakeholders, then it could be also a way of additional revenue streams um, for their resilience. Um, and why we, particularly here in Europe, uh, Police Learning Platform decided to tackle this topic in a webinar sense, a webinar context, is because tourism is um, a quite a popular topic among the currently ongoing projects. So we have 13 projects focusing on tourism, and uh, eight of them uh, are under social Europe. Uh, this is also why today we sort of have this social connotation to this topic. So it's a bit of an explorative uh, webinar in the sense that we are, we're interesting to hear from the presenters and then to discuss in an open setting on, on what could be the social and collaborative aspects of agritourism and does it have also some, let's say, benefits that go beyond purely uh, economic uh, benefits. Um, so this is sort of the backdrop on, on how we approach the topic. Uh, that we'll, we'll now see if also the speakers agree with this framing or not. Um, but with this, I would like to welcome then to the stage our first speaker, our keynote, Eileen, to walk us through uh, the, the experience and knowledge from East Flanders. Please, Eileen. Yes, hello. Good morning, uh, everybody. I will start my, sharing my screen.
This is fine. Yes, super. It works. Yes. It's full screen. We see. Go ahead. Okay. So good morning. Uh, my name is Aline, and I'm uh, working for uh, as a uh, management advisor in at ESEF, the Economic Council of East Flanders in uh, Belgium. And today I take you briefly through uh, the story of the Interroad Interreg project brand tour. So um, the project um, aims to improve tourism in certain regions through the promotion, innovation and um, diversification of the supply chain. So the project focuses on the relationship between tourism and entrepreneurship. And through the project, um, ESEF, in collaboration with uh, Tourism East Flanders, um, exchanges experience on stimulating entrepreneurship in the tourism sector. So Brand Tour uh, was part of the SME competitiveness priority. And um, this focuses on the competitiveness of European SMEs and, it's, uh, and is an implementation of the EU uh, Small Business Act. So um, in the project, we collaborated with five other regions, you can see, including two partners from uh, Italy. So ESEF, um, the Economic Council of East Flanders, is a regional development association founded by the province of East Flanders itself in 50, 1955. And the mission of ESEF is to strengthen and support uh, socio socioeconomic development in the province of East Flanders. Um, we stimulate new entrepreneurship in the tourism sector and we organize uh, management programs uh, for SMEs. We also support uh, the regional food cluster and stimulate the relationship between tourism development and regional products. Um, so from both ESEF and Tourism East Flanders, we reviewed uh, the past policy plans, um, so you can see. And they were both uh, expiring in 2019. So from these previous uh, policy plans, um, we have some attention points we wanted to focus on further. Uh, and these are to develop sustainable, qualitative and in innovative tourism products, um, to advise and stimulate tourism SMEs on creating um, these new tourism products. So uh, cooperation between public and private actors and uh, stimulating new entrepreneurship in the tourism sector. And the last one is to coordinate different local tourism initiatives uh, on a regional level and uh, new value creation through cooperation uh, and exchange of experience between tourism SMEs and other sectors such as sports, culture, uh, the local food sector, uh, horticulture like flowers um, and crafts. So um, special attention is paid to the synergy between the tourism sector and other economic sectors. Uh, for instance, um, we are investing in the use of regional products as an extra for East Flanders. So like beer, chocolate, Geneva, sweets. Um, and this way we ensure divers diversification in the tourist offer for the benefit of our province. Uh, these three goals you can see um, needed to be further developed in, the, in our new policy plan. So um, increasing the competitiveness of SMEs in the broad tourism sector, um, inclusive the hospitality um, and uh, true uh, marketing, uh, branding and communication. Uh, so we want to fully valorize um, the economic potential of the tourism sector and we want to create a better, uh, better policy tools to develop new tailor-made tourism products that meet the needs of um, emerging target groups. So um, in the project, the first three years, we developed uh, the action plan uh, through gathering all the ideas and information from a lot of stakeholders, um, local partners, etc. And in 2000, 2020, 2021, um, the Economic Council committed to the realization of an action plan in which we translate the experience um, gained with the other project partners into actions uh, for East Flanders. Um, but we also took recommendations or good ideas with us uh, for the development of our new policy plan of 2020-2025. Um, so make sure you have uh, consulted all of your stakeholders 
and take into account you have interviewed um, everyone more or less involved in the subject matter. Um, at ESEF, we identified some important trends for tourism in East Flanders. So in our action plan, we focused on gastronomy, uh, craftsmanship, and uh, local producers for the further sustainable development of tourism in East Flanders. So now I would like to give you two uh, examples of actions uh, that were included in our action plan of Brand Tour, and they are a consequence of our uh, lessons learned. And uh, both of the good practices, um, we are still progressing um, today. So for the um, gastronomy section, uh, Tasteful East Flanders ambassadors were honored. So these are uh, people from the hospitality and tourism industry who give uh, regional products uh, leading place in their businesses. Um, so far we have uh, recognized like uh, 25 ambassadors and most of them are local um, shops and local caterers, but they are also uh, B&Bs and restaurants. So we uh, launched that um, this action during the Brand Tour project and every year we have uh, several new ambassadors. In this case, um, especially we learned that the number of tourists in East Flanders has been increasing year after year. So, uh, and we did not fully use our um, sources of experience. So the opportunity was to bring tourists into contacts with local food products, um, their produ producers and the stories behind. So we wanted to put uh, local products uh, and local food entrepreneurs more in the spotlights. Um, who is behind the product. Um, so our uh, slogan is do something local or do local. Um, there was one difficulty to implement our action plan and uh, namely COVID, but it's it's been a while. Uh, so the catering industry was closed. Uh, there was no access allowed, uh, for example, in hotel schools. Uh, no tourists visits uh, were allowed, so we could not make uh, nice pictures or video material, but um, I hope this is a this will not uh, come back. So um, for the second uh, good practice, uh, we also organized an East Flemish wine tour where local uh, wine producers opened their doors to tourists, clients, uh, the neighbors, etc. Um, each wine producer gives to give uh, tourists a free tour in his company and on the field. Um, the winemakers explain how the production process works and tells the tourists more about uh, the local wines, uh, their entrepreneurial story. So tourists can have a look behind the scenes and learn the story behind the product. Um, they can also discover the region um, and its tourist attractions. So of course, a tasting uh, cannot be missed. Um, so come and taste uh, East Flanders, uh, like we say. Uh, the first uh, wine tour took place in 2018 um, um, when the project um, was still ongoing. So, and on August 25, uh, now in 2024, we organized the wine tour for the third time. So, 28 of uh, 35 East Flemish um, vineyards have participated and opened their domains uh, to tourists. And with this wine tour, we developed a new sustainable and in innovative tourism product, uh, which was one of our goals. Um, as I said before, we want uh, to create cooperation between tourism SMEs and uh, other sectors such as uh, sport and the local food sector. So we set up uh, seven different uh, cycling and walking routes who connect the wineries. Um, it's for for tourists, but also for uh, inhabit inhabitants, residents um, in our country. Um, but also we started uh, from our own strengths. So our unique landscape offers many opportunities. Uh, we, ha we have hills, uh, cobbled streets, um, the city of Ghent, um, but also the rural areas. So combining urban tourism with rural visits was a logical step for us. And uh, the big success factors um, are being a tourist in your own region. Um, also that you don't always have to go far away to do something fun and uh, that it doesn't have to, co to cost uh, that much. 
So I will end with some uh, conclusions. Um, to support the gastronomy and agri-food sector, it's important to take the necess necessary time. So SMEs and local food producers are so busy with their own businesses that it is that there's hardly any time left uh, for other activities. Um, also start on time because such a process takes longer than, uh, than we expect or than expected. Um, sometimes a good ID is not always easy to find. So have patience and check out the IDs or the good IDs uh, that are not always obvious. Um, if you heard of or uh, saw a good ID, ask the executor to explain the practice in detail for, more, for gathering more uh, information. Um, maybe that's an important one, regularly review with your government or policy, uh, but also with the stakeholders, uh, the farmers, the local producers, the SMEs. Um, yeah, it's, it's very important um, to take the stakeholders, uh, to have the stakeholders uh, close to you. Um, take along examples that work well and ask about practices that have failed. You can learn at least as much from these. Um, so find out the do's and the don'ts of uh, previous practices. And in any case, it's very important to take with you that um, ex exchanges of experiences, uh, good practices, workshops, uh, personal dates, um, study visits. They enabled us to set out the lines for, uh, for of course, our new uh, policy plan, but also for corporations between partners in the tourism in the agritourism sector. And um, yeah, that's uh, very important. So keep an open mind. Um, it's a real added value of it was for us, uh, it is for us. So this was my last, my last slide, excuse, excuse me. Um, thank you for uh, the attention. Thank you, Aline. And it's really great to have you as the first speaker because I, I still expect in the audience, and we have around 90 attendees currently, that there are quite many that have just started their Inter Europe journey within the project. And just seeing the, you know, you as a, as a alumni in a way who has gone through a project, you have done an action plan, you've date, done policy changes. And it's also a pleasure to see that some of these initiatives that you identified back then are still ongoing. So I hope this is also inspirational. Uh, for the other listeners on, on seeing the long-term perspective of what their projects uh, are doing. Um, mm -hmm. While we're getting the questions uh, from the chat, and I saw that there were already some there, I want to ask just one thing, Eileen, because on your last slide, you talked about the do's and the don'ts. And and often in Interact Group, we emphasize always the good practice, the good practice. So in, in, in from EastLanders, uh, is there some don't that you have noticed that may be a lesson learned that uh, you, would you would recommend for the others to avoid? Yes, um, it's it's a process. So uh, we learned through the process uh, what we have to do or what what we ha don't have to do. So maybe ideas who who are in, in who are sitting in our mind are not the the best ones. So you have to speak with everybody. You have to um, yeah. You have to um, take notes. You have to uh, um, you have to read a lot. Uh, so because the first idea. Um, is not always the best idea. Um, mm. So yes, you have to take your stakeholders, uh, partners uh, close to you. I said it before, and that's the the main uh, reason why practices come to uh, become good practices. So yeah, that's really good advice. It's so easy to fall in love with your own idea, right? So it's, yes, <laughs> um, exactly. But Eric, um, do we have questions from the audience that we can pass on to Eric? Yes, we do. Um, good morning to all. We had an interesting question on the preconditions, I think, relating to what was there before to make it everything you did possible. You said you were consulting all the stakeholders, but that presupposes that you know how to find them and that they are maybe organized. Maybe you can reflect a bit on what you think was the precondition to make this happen. And maybe some regions have maybe have to be attentive to are these preconditions really there or do I need to go a bit further down to be able to recreate these preconditions? Yeah, okay. Um, as I understand uh, in a good way, um, we have a, an, a group of, uh, 10 years ago, we started a group um, of local producers. Eh? We promoted them. So 
Um, nowadays, um, we have a group of more than 270 local producers in every sector, uh, also the wine sector, but also uh, meat and chocolate and beer, of course. Um, so, and we um, we have organized them under um, the Tasteful East Flanders, Lekker Oost Vlaams, Tasteful East Flanders Network. So we are doing a lot of um, actions with them, um, but they don't need to um, go with us. Um, they are free to uh, enjoy us and join us, uh, uh, join us, excuse me, um, in um, uh, in a market uh, through uh, through webinars. Uh, we gave them um, a lot of possibilities to join the network to promote their products. Uh, to yeah, we mm -hmm. we. We are looking for different ways to promote these local producers um, because it's the, I mean, it's important that the producers um, sell uh, sell more, of course, um, and that's our uh, main uh, goal. So it's yes. yeah, we we started with a a, a, a good network uh, of local producers, and so we are the connection between them and other. Uh, local communities, the government, the uh, universities, etc. So we make oh. a connection for them. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yes, yeah, so that's interesting. Also, you say 10 years, so it's a long, it takes a long time. Uh, if I understand correctly, the starting point was not so much tourism, but helping them sell their products, maybe attending fairs or, you know, exporting that kind of thing, was it? So just yes. you needed something to attract, bring them on board. What was their value added to be part of this? That's also interesting that you you may not necessarily start from tourism, but that's a precondition then to have something to attract them. Why would they come along? Yeah, I, I think the reason is that they can um, they can be in the spotlight eh, through actions. We um, we 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 yeah we um, yeah through actions from us and from uh, tourism East Flanders. So tourism East Flanders, we. Uh, we are working uh, together in a in a very good way. So I think uh, make making promotion for their own company and their own products are the main reasons who uh, who they're joining uh, our network. Yes. Maybe I can also ask a bit more about the uh, ambassadors that you mentioned as a good practice. So um, are there conditions to becoming an ambassador, and what is sort of expected from this uh, ambassador? Yes. Uh, indeed, there uh, we have so uh, four sectors of ambassadors: uh, the shops, caterers, uh, B and Bs, and restaurants. And for each of the se of these sectors, we made uh, some rules. Uh, um, so a local shop, uh, for example, has to have um, at minimum eighty percent of the products uh, has to come from East Flanders. So uh, and then they are a local shop. Um, and then we and Tourism East Flanders make promotion uh, for them. So um, they always can uh, they always can be an ambassador. Um, we are looking for them, but also some we, we have questions from themselves to become an ambassador um, of Tasteful East Flanders, yes. That's well, quite nice. So you basically with these rules, you create the um, conditions or the initiative the incentive that uh, you, you know if you bring in enough local producers we will promote you more so i think there's like a uh, again as, as, a, as a business owner it probably is quite clear cut like do i do i will i do this to get the benefits from, from you and tourism east flanders so yes that's quite nice uh, eric do we have any other questions from the chat this this stage not right now. Feel free to write down in the chat if you have any other questions. Yep, thanks. So uh, then we'll see Aline again in the panel discussion uh, at the end of the webinar. And then if you have new questions that come up, we will take them then. So thank you once again, Aline, for the for the a keynote. And I will invite our second speaker, uh, Simina from Romania. Please, the floor is yours. You're muted, Simina. Okay. So hello again, and thank you for having us today to share our experience about um, a food, agro food, let's say tourism product, which is Sibiu local breakfast. Um, I will share my screen. 
So, um, but um, uh, since I, I do have like a, a short movie about uh, about our local breakfast, I will invite you to. I hope that you had uh, you had already had uh, br breakfast today, because I will invite you to see our short movie about about CBU local breakfast. So let me share that the movie. Okay. I cannot. Anyway, we shall see later on if it's possible. I think you can try again by stopping the sharing and sharing right. the video. Or... Yeah, but I, uh, the screen. I don't know why I cannot, uh, I cannot see the desktop anymore. But anyway, I think that I will show it at the end of the presentation if we still have time for it. Okay, so, okay let's do it like this. But then you can go to full full screen mode. Yes. Okay. Yeah, worse. Thanks. Okay. So I'm Smila Mane. I'm working for Cebu County Tourism Board, uh, which is a public private partnership. So um and uh, the the good experience we think it's a good experience where we are sharing with you today was born uh, when our uh, local administrations thought to 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 write and to build a public policy about food and gastronomy and to become a food destination and um, wh while bidding for the European European region of gastronomy 2019 uh, us as the tourism board we wanted to encapsulate the six focused areas of a European region of gastronomy in a tourism product. And at that moment, uh, these are the, the, these were the, the, the focus areas you are seeing on my on the screen. Uh, we thought to offer as a tourism board the authentic experience uh, of, of our uh, of our uh, of our uh, landscape and of our food from the very from the very first of meal of the day and which is which is the breakfast. So uh, with this local breakfast, we wanted to cover diversity of, of our, of the cultural diversity of our territory, to link the urban areas with the rural areas, to think of how to educate our, uh, our uh, SMEs and also our travelers, to think of sustainability and um, supporting SMEs is very important right now. So also through this program, we, we intend to support uh, uh, tourism SMEs, but also agricultural SMEs and digital agenda, which is important for both marketing and uh, for distribution purposes. The program was during the time was supported by two uh, interreg projects, uh, Euroga project uh, for which we are like a good practice. That's why we are here today to present our good practice, but we are also part of another project, which is, uh, which is Krista who allowed us to learn even more about how important food is for, a, for the tourism product. And uh, since uh, you haven't seen our movie, I want to, to present a little bit how we are looking at our destination. I think, first of all, landscape, cult the cultural and natural landscape of a destination is very important. And tourism can contribute to preserve this landscape through the kind of experiences we are choosing to, pro to, to build and promote. And uh, Sibiu County is one of the most renowned county in Romania for sheep breeding and for cheese making. And for us, this is very important to bring the cheese from our local producers, from the shepherds, on the tables of the tourism businesses. So on the on the right side of, of the slide, you can see really the the local cheese local cheese we have. Uh, you can see a traditional shepherd and the landscape he's living in. And on the on the left side, you can see the new let's say the new the new motiv motivations of consumers of travelers who are more active. They will go and see this nice landscape and do participate in uh, I don't know line, running competitions. And when coming back, they will need different different kind of uh, meals and breakfast. So we wanted to link all this and also to link the new motivations of travelers with the with the food produce of the territory. Um, Shortly, 
we can say that CB Local Breakfast is a capacity building program. It is also a certification program and you will see the criteria you, this program is based on. And also we think it's a good marketing program uh, because it's a, like a collaborative, collaborative marketing program. Um, so the technical part of this CB Local Breakfast, we have uh, quality guidelines and also an assessment chart. And on you, you can see right, right here the, the the categories of of criteria that are important and that uh, are used as the guidelines for those who are part of these programs and who are who can be who can be part of the programs. It is uh, tourist businesses, be it big hotels, hotels, guest houses, or restaurants. So everybody in the tourism sector that can offer breakfast. And um, Sibiu County Council, which is the which is the policy maker for uh, for our region, decided to to uh, to uh, to define the catchment area for what local local means, which is seventy kilometers around the distribution the distribution point. So for us, it was important to uh, to guide our uh, members and to offer a diversity of products and dishes and to, to stay within this catchment area. And then what is also important is that we are, together with each member, we exploited the added value of the food. Added value meaning to use certified products, to use, to go and revise local dishes, historic dishes, to, um, to um, innovate on traditions and come with new dishes as i told you which are more adapted to uh, to the new to new travelers and even to new locals uh, attitudes and uh, and uh, eating um, habitudes so any value is important and also sustainability and sustainability we can of course go and see all the pillars of sustainability in this case, food waste was very important, and each of, of, of every member uh, need to think of the measure they can take to uh, to um, to reduce food waste. Uh, storytelling is also involvement, and in this case, the involvement of staff is very important because, uh, okay, you can label your products, the dishes, but it's important for the staff to be part of this process and to to tell the story of the dish they are they are bringing on the table to do this connection between the local producers and the and the guests communication of course is part of this of the storytelling and uh, to really deliver the sense of place and uh, part of the program is also the the monitoring of the guest satisfaction and uh, to talk with the guests and to see how they can advance on their product as is the destination, we all we are always looking to create links between the territory, the destination, and each each uh, business. So we encourage them to be our ambassadors and to use books, be it uh, cookbooks or any other brochure films to promote the region. And most of them right now they do have like shops with uh, with the product with products and produces local food produce in their own in their own units. The benefits, the main benefits for the three main stakeholders, let's say, uh, are quite evident. I think that we can co we contribute to the increased quality of uh, of the of the tourism product and to their competitiveness. Uh, those who are really uh, using local produce have a stronger differentiation on the travel market. And uh, during the COVID time, we've seen how important it is to have like a resilient food system, a local food system. Uh, we're also seeing that they are reducing costs on the long term. And uh, through this um, uh, cooperation, food producers, tourism businesses, and other invited experts, I will talk a about them a little bit later on. Uh, I think that we are contributed to, to upskilling our business, uh, to, our, to upskilling our, our businesses. And I think that up, this upskilling, it also uh, goes to the, to the food producers 
who by interacting with the tourism businesses, they will increase the quality of their products or the, the aesthetics of their uh, of their products, the way they are um, they are keeping the, the quality of, of their produce. Networking is the most important one. And uh, through this kind of programs, I think that is the, the first objective we are achieving. We are really strengthening the network at the territory level. Uh, we hope the guests will are really are really happy with this uh, with uh, having the opportunity to taste to taste the territory territory from the very as I told you from the very first meal of the day, and uh, they also have the chance to become more engaged in the community. And also, if right now we are claiming that we want to travel responsible, this is a way really to to do something in a responsible way and to consume tourism to consume. Uh, destination in a very responsible way. Um, in everything we are doing right now, we are trying to see how we can contribute to the sustainable development goals. And uh, this, I think it's a good exercise because sometimes when speaking about sustainability for local SMEs, it is, it is difficult to, to give concrete examples of what they, are, they can really do to contribute uh, to sustainability, to their own sustainability and the sustainability of the territory they, they are part in, of the, of the community they are part in. So speaking of, I will give you some, just some examples of how we are, of how we are promoting this program and showing our partners how they can contribute to sustainable goals. And of course, food measures, I think are very important right now, but it's also important to, uh, for the tourism businesses to support small scale food producers, which is the case in our territory. Also, uh, we are facing a lot of um, uh, exports of uh, imports, sorry, imports of, uh, of products, which of course are um, most of them could be delicious, but I think it's very important to contribute also to preserving the diversity of our local species and the genetic diversity of our territory. So they can contribute to this. Um, I was talking about healthy, uh, healthy options at the very, at the very beginning of the program. We have also worked with a nutritionist who participated in workshops and explained to our members how they can offer a balanced, a balanced uh, breakfast and a healthy one. So it's not only about offering local, but also thinking of how to, to offer this kind of balanced breakfast. Uh, guidance, I think, is the most important um, approach. Um, what is important for such a program is to really have like a product manager, somebody to take care of the of the members and to go and um, and mentor other members. We have we had such a product manager at the very beginning. Right now, we integrate this um, food approach in a more um, wide, let's say, sustainability uh, support program for SMEs that we are having, in which food, of course, is very important. In the tourist sector, we know that most of the people engaged are women, and for breakfast, women were very, are very important because they are doing uh, part of so, so much part of the, of, the, of the dishes, but also young people. Tourism is one of the sectors that will integrate young people and uh, will create new jobs. And I think it's very important, especially in rural areas where we are doing a lot of efforts to keep young people in the community. So this kind of project will really um, support young people to start a new business in rural areas and to build sustainable communities. Uh, everything related to environmental impact are, are considered, be it uh, no plastic, Right now, it's a, it's a rule not to use any plastics. It's a law, but also to think of eco-friendly products. Uh, to use, uh, for instance, uh, handcrafted products uh, for uh, for breakfast, or when you know, when 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 offering takeaway breakfast, to to use uh, eco-friendly packages. Marketing is important. I think uh, most of them are happy to be part of these uh, marketing campaigns we are offering to them. And also we are uh, we have partnered with uh, CBU City app, which is a uh, which is a, a promotional app for the for our city, CBU City, where the members of CBU uh, CBU local breakfast are well promoted. Bio biodiversity preservation, of course, and cultural preservation. Okay. 
Um, so this is a program that we think can contribute to our, let's say, final goal to be one of the European destinations who are doing uh, something concrete to achieve the goal to become uh, to become greener by 2030. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, I think it was really nice to to, to hear the, the story that you just presented. And I was wondering, um, you mentioned, you used this phrase, new motivation of travelers. Mm -hmm. And and one of the slides, you also had uh, the uh, responsible travel as a, as, a, as a keyword. So is this something that you see as a trend in Romania? And, and could this be a signal that there is more space for agriculturism offer and products that that there is a new need for something like this. But what is your your what are your thoughts on it? I definitely think there is a new need and new expectations, but I also consider that travelers need really concrete guidance. I, I mean you'll not tell them be responsible, but you'll tell them go in this local village and we'll taste the most uh, I know delicious uh, local cheese and uh, meet the sh shepherd in uh, in the mountains in the alpine uh, in the alpine area. So I think it's up to us to guide our travelers to be responsible. And I think yes, they are really inclined to use this kind of experiences, even volunteer to be part of a local community. And uh, yeah, it's up to us to um, to create this uh, con good context for uh, for involvement and for responsible attitudes and uh, yeah. Uh, Eric, Bye. welcome back. Um, <laughs> from, from the uh, audience, have we picked up any questions? Yes, we did. I'm personally fascinated now by the complementarity. The first presentation was really first product development, value chains, and then adding on tourism. Now, if I understand your presentation, you you have you start with tourism and you working on tourism, you develop more professional products, better products, better presentations of the marketing. So it's a bit how it, these two things can work jointly and in different ways. And the questions are very much related to that. It's about how these products are then being delivered. The question from Laura Gascon Herrero from Teruel in Spain. So the delivery of products, how do you get them to the customers? Is it um, ordered? Are they ordered directly to the producers? Are they delivered by the producers? How does it work for product deliveries? You mean for the for the, for the local producer for the farmers? Yeah, this this was a I think this is a challenge. But um, with the unfortunately, fortunately, after the COVID, most of the farmers, most of the producers, um, invested in the distribution channel, and right now they are more able to 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 distribute their product directly to the business uh, to the business owners. Also, I have to say that we are in a region where we have uh, a lot of local markets. Even our local administrations have organized this kind of local markets where local producers from the entire region come each Saturday and uh, and uh, deliver their products. And I have to admit that for our uh, for our business uh, SMEs, this is the first this is the first place I, we are uh, we are encouraging them to to go and uh, meet their uh, let's say new new partners for uh, for this Sibiu local breakfast. And if they do not find them there, then we will, of course, go and look for other uh, partners. Yes. Thank you. We also, it wasn't quite a question, but there was intervention by Euromontana, so the Association of European Mountain Areas, um, and they are working on uh, geographical indications. You think this is something you would be, this could lead into the use of geographical indication as both as a then, as a, solution to develop products, to market products, and also in connection to tourism. Is, is it a, a part of this strategy to work on geographical indications? Yes, this, in fact, this is one of our criteria in, in, the, in the chart uh -huh. to, uh, to encourage and to use uh, certified products. Uh, our cheese is a geographical certified um, certified product, and uh, also we have some salami. But uh, also we have a lot of ecological uh, eco ecological uh, products, so we encourage them to use uh, to this to use this, be it honey or uh, fruit or vegetables. So yes, I think it's important to um, to encourage to encourage the businesses, and this is also an argument for the producers. To go through this process of being certified, because I don't know mm -hmm. how it 
what's going on in other countries, but uh, let's say that certification sometimes is not part of their of their um, first first motivation. Uh, as long as they do have uh, customers, they don't see the motivation to to go to this uh, process, which sometimes can be can be difficult um, because most of them in our destination, be it tourism businesses of agricultural businesses, they are family owned, they are small scale businesses, and they have a lot of challenges with their operational uh, activities. So yes, I think it's up to the public policies and um, all of us um, tourism boards to encourage them and to support to really support them to, to make the difference and to create uh, advantages on the market. And we are doing this, yes. So you support, that's one of the questions we had, who is helping with marketing was specifically the question on marketing, but now certification, marketing, all of that is, those things are interlinked. Who are you collaborating with? Do you have some some special specialists on this field of, of marketing and certification to support uh, the, the, the producers? In fact, uh, for, the, for the producers, uh, there are the agricultural institutions that are taking care of the, of the local producers and there are uh, certification schemes that are dealing with them. Uh, local administrators are, are really involved in this uh, because they want to have, um, to have their, uh, their producers set, certified. Um, we are not really doing this kind of work of, of, um, of assistance for a producer because we are doing this for our tourism sector and um, for instance right now also we are we are running this kind of sustainability project for SMEs and uh, as I told you food is important local producers are, are important so we are we are mainly our role is to to put them together and, and to create meeting contexts for them to for the tourism businesses to become aware of these certification advantages and also the local producers to to understand that they are also part of this bigger ecosystem. So mm. it's like this. But for the marketing, um, uh, I think that all of us, we are marketing, we are marketing those who are really taking uh, steps to, to provide quality, to have a, a, positive, a positive impact on their territory, on their local communities, and also to, who are eager to, to innovate on on the product because this is also um, an aspect that it's important not only traditionally uh, produced but also adapted to new to new customers to new habits to new diseases let's say sometimes unfortunately there are many many interconnected channels sorry yeah. yeah so i'm also going to be now stepping in as the, as the moderator and keeping time so there were some other questions coming up um but uh, we will get back to these questions also offline if needed directly. Uh, for now then, Simina, thank you. We'll see you soon shortly in the panel, but I would like to invite our third speaker, Suzanne, to share us uh, an example from Austria. Please stand. Hello, everybody. I am trying to share. I think, yeah, now it should work. Um, Yes, perfect. Hello. Perfect. Welcome, everyone. My name is Susanne. I'm the head of the EU project management in the Steering Business Development Agency, and we are located in the south, southern part of Austria. I will share with you today the festival of the um, Böller Hirschbirne, which is a typical kind of bear, and I'm with my best practice more hands-on today. So uh, first... I would like to go ahead and talk a little bit about our uh, Intrac Europe project. We are first time lead partners here. We focus on the thematic of geographical indication, as you have mentioned this before. And we are in our second year with seven partners, Bulgaria, Poland, Finland, Greece, Spain, and France. And of course, France, Greece, and also a little bit Austria is pretty advanced in this uh, uh, geographical indicational products and less advanced regions. Uh, we are talking today about the Böller bear and it's a 
quality seal protected of origin PDO since May 2015. And of course, if you have this kind of product, you also have to promote it. And I think in terms of trend language, it's called eventification. So building an event around this typical uh, product we have in Austria, um, of course, rises, um, the whole area supports the SMEs around it, the producers, tourism, and also uh, agriculture. But we will hear here a little bit later about this. So in SME origin, we focus on the competitiveness of food SMEs specialized in this uh, product. For example, in Styria, more, more known that the, this herbal bear is the pumpkin seed oil. Um, and we focus on strengthening the value chain, the digital transformation, and also the product labeling. Yeah, we are pretty sure that the regional food products have a tremendous impact on local development, a cultural asset, and generate cooperations between various actors like tourism, agriculture, and so on. And you can see this in our best practice. So we have this really colorful hiking event and festival in the heart of Styria. It's not only about enjoying the landscape, it's also about bringing people together. Um, it's this culinary highlights and um, yeah, it's a hiking day, but uh, it's a hiking day since 28 years. And now the festival grows, grows, grows every year. Um, it's on our Austrian bank holiday. It's the 26th of October every, every year. And um, it's well known all over Austria, but also in Germany, in we call it Dach region. That means like the German speaking countries with Germany and Switzerland. So uh, as you can I'll show you later, also the, the uh, tourism numbers of accommodation and so on uh, were rising throughout the period. And it's, of course, an important tool to um, get these rural areas um, more promoted, as Simina mentioned before in her presentation, to have this local culture and tradition um, still alive, but also create jobs and values even for younger people. And here you can see the geschützte Ursprungsbezeichnung, which is the label that's really important. Good. We have like 5,000 hikers and at the festival there are around uh, 7,000 people. It's uh, organized by the Böllar Valley Advertising Association and the Styrian a tourist board so you, have, so you have like this small local um association which is of course um getting together everybody um volunteers associations in the in this in the in Berlara valley and of course the, the styrian tourist board which is all over styria and has uh, bigger connections the event is now a really brand uh, everybody knows it and that on the 26th of october you are there to hike um, there are different hiking routes uh, longer ones and more family friendly ones and in addition as i said before it's a festival now you have the exciting program music performances and so on really good food all about the hirschbirne and a um, really important thing is that the uh, austrian television um, station, the ORF, is a big player and a big partner of this hiking day. And as you all know, um, the media presence is really important for getting focus on a certain topic. And this is here um, really a learning to, to engage um, TV stations. So 28 years, of course, it started, it wasn't starting that big, but it was growing uh, every time. And 2023, almost 908,000 guests were welcomed in this region. It's, of course, the whole region and not just this one day. But um, you can see an increase of 4.5% uh, compared to the pre-corona years. So there's always a rise in, um, in this area with tourism. Of course, this event brings their people. You see the, the environment, the, the nature, the, the good food and everything. And people come back. They go bicycle, uh, uh, hiking, go with their bicycle and so on and doing different wellness programs. In the region, there are a lot of spas as well. So um, 
it grows every year and it brings um, together the economic impact in local businesses and tourism. Because tourists, what are you doing when you are abroad? You bring back home some presents and of course it's the local presents. And this is why also this label from the Sabella Hirschbirne is really, really important also for tourists because you have a certain standard of quality and um, yeah, and also the taste they have the quality in the product yes and the media attention as i was mentioning before so lessons learned and resources you are needed um you have these national tv stations that are really important and also the big sponsors like the tourism agency they have like uh, big sponsors in insurance companies they are also sending people there for health purposes and so on the big uh hotels are there to support this event and of course uh, the region itself you have to be the backbone of this whole festival is the people there that are helping, the volunteers, everybody who is doing uh, the hiking trails before, the people who are um, bringing in their meals and the food and the cul culinary and the show program. So the volunteer helpers, yeah, that's really important, but it also brings the people together. You form a certain group of identity and it's the same with the hiking. So uh, it's a free access, so they have to raise money with the sponsors and also with the event around and selling the food and drinks. And there again, the Böller Hirschbirne, which can be used for uh, jams and also for liquor, for alcoholic um, things. They are making a certain kind of mustard, for example. So the whole menu there, when you're ordering something, this beer is included. The goals, of course, of the tourism area in this region was to make the people aware, to bring them there. And as I mentioned before, that they see the region, then to show this culinary and cultural heritage, because this is really pure nature there and promoting tourism in the region, the soft tourism and strengthening the local economy. So the potential the eventification for the festival. So hiking together uh, is building, it promotes a sense of community and togetherness. The same with the one, the event, um, uh, the ones who are uh, making the event, it brings the people together. It's also with hiking, with sports. You know, when you're doing sports, your sports pales are much closer to you than, um, than any, anyone else. It's a team building, for example. So I think um, that's really important. It brings the local community together. Everybody's meeting new people. Everybody's uh, talking with, 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 the, with the others. So it's easy to, to talk with locals, to talk with other visitors. Um, it's, it's really a nice feeling. I'm also there uh, sometimes, as so not every year, but when I have time and it's really a nice, nice community and you are included immediately there so of course this health aspect for hiking but also the environmental awareness you don't see there any plastic uh, laying around or anything it's just pure nature green and this this culture is also should be something worse to us and we would love to protect this region as it is um then, of course, this great setting and these regional speciali specialities. So um, the food producers, of course, always created new things with this Bella Hirschbirne. There are uh, master cooks, for example, that cr create new menus and have always new products, um, new packages of, of labeled products together so that the people can also bring something home. And... Um, and also the close cooperation, always getting uh, closer because the local producers also sell in the big hotels their, their food products and so on. And I also would like to mention in our SME Origin project, we have a similar best practice. It's the Rose Festival in Stara Sagora, Bulgaria. You can check this out also on the Good um, Practice database. It's a simi similar to this one, but it's one week. And... The same as here in, in the Bella region, you, you can see that the accommodation hotels, um, you don't get anything in this week. You have really to book in advance for all, a year before, for example. So um, these events have impact 
on the media side. And when you are there, you tell your, your friends back home, you bring something uh, with you. So there are uh, really big uh, effects on this. So thank you very much for your attention. Um, if you need any more information, just follow us on the SME region. We are on every social media uh, channel and thanks a lot. Thank you, Suzanne. Um, it's also nice to know that basically we all have still a chance to come in October again this year. <laughs> yeah. On, on the hiking trail, so 26th of October is noted. Um, maybe my question, first question would be around well, you, you obviously have a long history of, of running this festival and it's getting po more popular now. But um, what would be the maybe main recommendation for a region that does not have such a festival or, around one of their local products? So what would be the first step? Uh, in... <laughs> to start, actually, <laughs> maybe it's the first first round, not that easy, but to, to, to find um, strong partners. Uh, to can promote this. I think the one of the crucial facts that this festival is so um, successful is the media partnership with the t TV station because that brings in the people and always reminds them by the mid of summer to October that there is this hiking festival and um, it takes time if you have something like this. I think um, now it's uh, this is, is a traditional event. I think when you're doing this now, you have to focus on your region, your, your positioning of the region, and be brave. Have some really crazy ideas, actually. I think this will work now. With a traditional event, it's easier. You have this long history. People know it, so almost 30 years. I think that's easier. But, but now, go on, be brave, and find something really... It can also be a little bit crazy to get people here first thing and always um, keep this tradition in mind because this this these products are so valuable and and pure actually and I think you can build around this really really nice stories thanks Eric I can imagine this is also about re making something that the locals really connect to so that if it's if it's artificial then it won't take yes that's true. <laughs> I was wondering a bit financially how if, if there is some kind of trend in the beginning, I can imagine you need quite a bit of funding to get things started. To, does it yes. become more financially autonomous with the years or how does it work? In yes, terms of exactly. Uh, they had a leader uh, leader funding for, for the, from the region to start with. And now they are more financially independent with the big sponsors. Yeah. But mm -hmm. of course, the land of Styria with the tourism board, they also it's public money more or less. The supporters. It's also very interesting to see how it, it has positive effects on the community itself. But I guess that's also some iterative process, like the I yes. imagine the local association groupings as as with the success they become, they have more confidence, they have more pride. So this is also interesting. How do you get this positive feedback, the, the positive uh, attraction? Yes, to, that's to true. Function? This drive actually. You have to do this the person the, the main leaders in the region have to be in the um to be really aware of the project and really uh the yeah the peers actually you have this these guys with you and then everything else will will run smoothly and this drive they have this drive in this region now I think this is sad but to to, to reach this uh, drive you have to communicate a lot and and this, and promote the benefits for the region I think when you start something like this. Mm -hmm. But I guess you, compared yeah. to the uh, previous speakers, we were more on the level of tourism association and, and you know SME support associations, and then the SMEs getting benefits. But here with this festival, it really seems that, that this is more on the community. And as already Eric also mentioned, it's it, you know you, if I understood correctly, you're also collaborating with local sports associations and more let's say these uh, non-profit sector free form community organizations locally. I guess if I understood yes. correctly. Yes. They're also so, in there. So there's like an added, added layer of, of uh, stakeholders involved in the promotion and, and valorization of the region and its assets in a way. So. Yes, it's as we call it now a quadruple helix. Uh, everybody <laughs> is involved actually, and they didn't know that they created something like this because it was growing. But uh, really great. civil society, society and everybody is involved now, yeah. But I think this is a nice way actually to also invite back uh, Simina and Aline and we go smoothly to the panel discussion stage. Um, so 
uh, you are welcome to turn on your cameras once again and join us. And I've been, I've been thinking throughout this webinar whether I start from the hard question or from the easy question. <laughs> and I think I'm going to start through with the hard question to get that out of the way. Because, um, you know, when we were devising this uh, webinar together with Eric and, and being under the social Europe track, Peter Europe, we were really wondering regarding agritourism or tourism as such, how much the social considerations feed in to the planning or strategic thinking. And I would just like to hear how, how it is in your view or in your regions. So when you develop a new tourism strategy or new initiatives locally to launch, how much is it still around, let's say, economic considerations? Like we want to support the local SMEs and their products, and we want more visitors because visitors you know, equals more spending, more tax returns, uh, or, home, or maybe it's about place awareness, uh, name recognition, uh, regional branding. Um, so are, are these still the more driving considerations compared to, let's say, the, the impact on the local community and the networks we're building and let's say the social social and health benefits potential. So how, how do you see it? Is there is one still sort of how, somehow higher in the considerations? And I'm just curious because it was a very explorative topic for us uh, and you as practitioners on, 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 on the ground, uh, it would be nice to hear how, how, you, uh, how you sort of think about this. So whoever wants to start first. Uh, Eileen, please. Um, yes, it's a difficult question, but I think uh, through our projects and uh, at the Economic Council, our aim is to create uh, more chauvinism, um, uh, more knowledge of residents towards uh, local products and producers. But uh, ultimate, ultimately, um, this should also lead to more sales, of course. Um, but it's not the main or the only reason. Um, it obviously, obviously depends from activity to activity, but um, and there are usually several drivers for it. So, um, yeah, and the other, on the one hand, um, it's it's um, it's more important to have a regional branding, or uh, they want to um, put them in the spotlight. But on the other hand, they want to make money of it. So you can't you can't ignore that. Um, I think it's. Uh, it's both uh, important. Thank you. Uh, Susan and Simina, do you agree with them? Or do you have yes. Uh, well, ac actually, the location that reminds the, f the point of view. Actually, I'm from a business development agency. So, of course, I think uh, it should be a win win. And the driver is, of course, to make business. But uh, times are changing. It's not all about, uh, about, um, having the highest uh, pr um, values and the highest wins actually it's also about uh, value and even the new generation they they want to create value and you have to reflect this also on the story so I think it will I would say it's both it's not just the commercial aspect it's both yeah please do you want to add yeah, something I think yeah we of course we also share I think I think it's important that right now we are um, we are having this exercise of looking at the balanced uh, impacts. So we don't uh, even as tourism board we don't look only at the figures of on even though we are there are of course destinations in Europe that need that need uh, an increase in in their tourism uh, activity. But as I've shown you, each time we are building a program, we are also looking on the impact of the local community, on how to engage the local communities, how to create bridges between different stakeholders. And I think that uh, this is an important, uh, this is an important exercise and a big step forward for the for the European uh, territories. And I think that Interreg Europe has helped us a lot because through this kind of uh, study visit and exchanges. We are not having only an um, egocentric focus on our own territory, but we are really trying to understand that, in fact, what we are doing in a territory can have impacts on, on somebody else, even, if I, uh, even though they don't live in our territory, but they will come as travelers or, uh, you know, we are now talking about resources how limited they are and about inclusivity, that there are people we, we need to think of on how to have access to tourism. And yes, I think that this balanced way of seeing uh, of seeing um, of seeing products is very is very important to to continue. And also I mean this was 
visible also on your sites that you you were using this SDG uh, framework to also think about uh, the impacts you have across the board, uh, which I was was quite nice to see earlier. Um, my second question is about the um, let's say we we've been talking about bringing together the tourism providers, or tourism businesses, but also tourism associations together with the food producers or the or the farms or the agricultural producers. Um, is this easy to do or is it challenging? So do, do, do these do these communities do they speak similar languages? Um, because I think in all the cases you are sort of the facilitators uh, who help connect these stakeholders. So uh, yeah, the question is do they speak similar languages? Do they understand the benefits of collaboration? Or is it still a bit of a, a rocky road because uh, there was yeah, some one of you mentioned that it might take ten years to do, to get somewhere with some things. So uh, curious to know how it's been for you. Because I have a short answer, I think it's also an ongoing process mm -hmm. in Romania right now. Because I have this uh, pastoral landscape behind me, I think we are facing changes in um, in in um, in values of what life is and what it, what happiness is in our uh, daily days. And I think that producers face a lot of challenges. Um, especially the alpine producers and uh, since we have Montana, or Montana with us I think they know better than me but yes I think it's it's a very de a delicate challenge right now to uh, to value our local producers and uh, to create um, distribution chains for them because they are contributing to preserving this kind of landscape and the biodi biodiversity we have and uh, yeah it's not easy because uh, we are the the context is changing so very often. So we have to be agile and to uh, to work on this issue uh, all the time. In fact, thank you, uh, Elena or Suzanne. Uh, from your perspective, is it easy to get food producers to collaborate with the let's say accommodations, hotels, uh, other tourism stakeholders? So... Uh, should I or? And um, I go ahead. Actually, I think in for speaking for Styria, it's a positioning for our food producers because um, the the gastronomy, the hotels, and every everybody they are buying the local uh, products because Styria is known for really good food. This is why the people are also coming here, and uh, it's the demand side also from our guests that they expect local good quality products. So I think in, in Styria it's not that problem. We were also doing a lot with the uh, kitchen chefs, for example. Um, so I don't see this. But in SMU region, for example, last week we were in Finland, in Savolina, and they had, for example, problems to get this local uh, product into the tourism region, and they are now trying to push it. So, but it's still, of course, in some regions ongoing. But what? when you were having this project meeting uh, there and you exchanged did you somehow identify why it, why it is easier in your region and harder in your yes region? i mentioned this best practice uh getting all the good uh, uh kitchen chefs together and uh and get new new menus and and try to them to to cook with the local products and they have like this uh, regional year of gastronomy and so this also started with the SME region project. So this is our first accent actually to get them more aware of what they have in the region. That's really nice to hear. Yes. And uh, well, Eileen, in your experience, uh, focusing a lot on gastronomy, has it been easy to get these, let's say, two sectors to talk the same language or? Yeah, as I said in my presentation, it's important to uh, contact the stakeholders on time because uh, it's a whole process. Um, so local food producers understand the benefits of collaborating with the tourism industry, but this is usually not uh, their prior priority. So um, I think personal contact is also very important um, because uh, the actions the actions you work out um, are supported by uh, also the tourism industry um, and the local producers. Um, so I think that's the yeah that's one of the most uh, important things. Yeah, I guess always being sensitive or aware of the let's say day to day challenges yes. of your target target group that yes. they would sort of. And why would they care about what you're trying to promote to them? Yeah. Um, exactly. One maybe shorter question that I sort of picked up. Well, 
bit from all of your presentations. I think all of you talked about also like tourism for locals or, or that the locals would come to the hiking trail or they would um, they, you know, visit the explore also the local breakfasts in their area and so on. So is agritourism still mostly for internal tourists or is it something that uh, you can still attract international tourists? At that? I'm curious because that, in a way it seems a bit more closer to the local country and local stories and local uh, traditions. Uh, and somehow it feels to me that maybe it is more about internal tourism than international tourism. I see, Aline, you are nodding, but uh, maybe you need to think about it for a moment. Um, um, yeah, I think that in our case, there were the foreign tourists, the foreign guests that really appreciate, I think first appreciated the local food and the, the local experiences. I think for Romania, it started with the foreigners and it uh, contributed to increasing the pride of also of the Romanians and of all the locals that these are important values for them. So, but I think that for us as a, yeah, as a destination, uh, it was important that we had uh, even though 20, 20, uh, 25% of, of the tourists are foreigners, so not as much, but uh, it was important for uh, for bring, for developing these kind of programs where, uh, where uh, local food is important. Thank you. Yeah, and our, yeah, sorry. Our main target groups are the inhabitants of East Flanders or Belgium um, as a whole group. Um, but I think our actions started um, uh, a bit inside eh? and um, we promoted them to the local, um, to the Belgian people. But um, nowadays, I think uh, we wanted to promote the local products through the shops and through our ambassadors, through um, BMBs uh, um, at uh, the foreigners. So uh, at tourism, uh, tourists mm -hmm. from uh, other countries. So I think in that case, we... We wanted to expand, um, yeah, via the shops and etc. Yeah, and I guess Susan, you talked a lot about this media collaboration, and in your case, also this uh, long history. So I guess there is already a lot of traction there, which is quite nice to promote to the international visitors as well. But look, we have this this festival has been ongoing for twenty eight years. Uh, yeah, it's a big thing. So. Yes, actually, I'm no tourism expert. I'm the food mm -hmm. expert, yes. but our uh, tourism board is doing a lot to promote it. Also, uh, different neighbor countries like Italy, for example, and also like for skiing in the whole region of Styria. There are certain certain uh, villages they are uh, really important for the for Netherlands and so on. So this is 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 uh now really really the international market is focused more more directly but still the most people come from austria they are traveling and they come to styria so we still our basic uh um uh, visitors are still coming from all over austria and then bavaria and germany yeah it's still like this it's maybe cultural reasons also for traveling uh they don't want to travel that long, but I think it's progressing. And also when uh, the South is getting hotter, so we, uh, of course, in the summer times, there are a lot of people coming from the South also to Austria and the Alps and so on. So we are benefiting a, li a little bit. Yeah, definitely. I mean, there are different layers to this topic, right? There's also yeah. about the carbon footprint of travel. Uh, I think COVID had an impact on people revisited or refound their own countries and regions to, to go to. Uh, currently, international flights are super expensive, so it's also like a socioeconomic thing where you might decide to go yes. locally rather than... Uh, and the chaos, all the, yeah. yeah. All the dips, <laughs> so it depends on also. But uh, Eric, um, have you had some questions from the chat that we could also in, in, include into this panel discussion? Yes, I wanted to get back to a question that was initially submitted during Simina's presentation um, from Tanya Ivek of the Zagorje Development Agency in Croatia. Her question was about brands and the possibility of conflicts between your more territorial brands like Sibiu Local Breakfast and producers' own brands and whether they sometimes there is a reluctance at, at, at adopting the new local brands as they may be in conflict. Is that something you've experienced that there are, can be conflicts between different brands and types of branding thinking, like 
to producers sometimes are, are producers sometimes reluctant at being somehow absorbed into something more territorial. Have you experienced this? Uh, we have not. And in fact, I think that branding in this case is not as important as uh, it is, for instance, to really create an authentic product that is available whenever people are coming and visiting our 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 destination. I think um, our aim is for everybody who is coming and visiting Sibiu to really have a local local breakfast. Sibiu local breakfast is not a brand. It's it's just I think it's a program. It's our it's like a local policy. It's most of a public policy than a than a branding. So we are integrating this local breakfast, uh, let's say, label into our food destination approaches. So I think it. Yeah, we 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 don't have this kind of. Have, in fact, we have never thought of this like a, like okay. a, a conflict of, uh, of branding and imaging. Thank you. Elino, Suzanne, do you have any reflections on, on brands that may be conflicting or having some issues of coordination between brands and maybe declare all uh, these specific origins or certified origins, etc.? Yeah, well, actually, we're doing a whole project on this. So this labeling <laughs> is, of course, important for us. Uh, what we have, for example, is like this heart of Styria, which is really, really known, um, this green heart. And they, we did some surveys on how consumer reflect on the PDO sign and on the Styria heart. And just 4% of consumers know that this is a product of origin. So this there should be much more effect, marketing effect that the people, the consumer have to know. And this uh, stereo heart is much more known and and really uh, stands for quality. So this is our branding, and this works really really good on food products in the region. And so far, no conflicts on that side. I don't. Yeah. Interesting. Thank you, mm. Eileen. Do you have any reflections on this? Yeah, I uh, I can agree with what uh, Suzanne said uh, about the PDA um, uh, label, but uh, I think we also work with uh, Tasteful East Flanders, but it's not a label but just to recognize uh, where what, what the origin is of the projects. So um, they can see, oh, it's from here, it's from Belgium. Um, so, but okay. more than that, it's... Uh, so what I hear is, sorry, yeah. <laughs> what I hear is a real clarity on what is the brand, what is then the program, what is the label. You Being very clear on that helps then uh, prevent any conflicts. I imagine that's also then a challenge of communication so everyone understands clearly what one wants to do with the label, what one wants to do with a program or a brand and promotion, getting all of this together. Nice. Um, yeah. and, uh, just as a last reflection, I somehow still picked up uh, from, from your presentations that the story still, storytelling is also key here with all of these things. Uh, and, and I guess it goes both regarding telling the story of the region, as we saw with the um, the local breakfast and taste of East Flanders, but then also, I guess, for the producers, uh, about selling the story behind their products. And, and this also, if I remember, uh, in, in the certification system that uh, Simina showed, there was importance of those scores also given if they have a story behind their product. And, you know, just thinking about it, it always seems uh, from the slides also that, you know, you have these beautiful photos of the farmer locally doing traditional cooking, and, and it seems to be important uh, in, in when you talk about agritourism that this visual language followed by a story uh, of heritage and, and culture is also key here right? i see i see her nodding so i guess my my, my sort of takeaway was more or less uh, accurate um i won't have time yeah in connection to that mod i just i get curious now but it is probably the topic for a new webinar is the role of social media in all of this and uh, we hear we heard about it for for from uh, for the the peer festival that it was social media strategy. We didn't hear so much from the others yet, but it would be really interesting to learn more about how this connects to a social media strategy working for the food producers, working for the tourism, and how that may come together somehow. But uh, yeah, maybe we that's, can that's get back to that. keep it, keep in mind for the future. You. I see um, you nodding. So I presume. And and also we didn't see. Uh, Simina's video, but maybe we can later see if we can put it to the article that we're producing and then people can rewatch it uh, in their own time afterwards. Um, so to, to wrap up today, and I would first want to thank our three speakers 
it was really wonderful to hear about your good practices and and the way you're developed you have had your project journey or where you are with your projects currently uh, and also have this uh, nice exchange of thoughts in the panel section so i hope it was interesting for the audience uh, considering the questions that came in I, I, it seems it was um just to stay still that we're also uh with eric uh, planning to organize a workshop a physical workshop this fall most likely end of november and uh, the topic is going to be around alternative tourism and optimizing the social and economic benefits of that. And so basically we want to explore um, the, the notion of something that somehow con contrasts to mass tourism and how especially rural regions or smaller regions can stand out in the tourism space and how do they can, then can come up with this other alternative offer of whether it's products or services. Um, so stay tuned, everybody who's attended today. Uh, we're going to launch the official communication about it um this week or next week most likely um uh, then you can already save the date and come to this uh, workshop and there also we're gonna be looking into gastronomy uh most likely as well as one of the subtopics so you're all very much invited uh, just stay tuned for the uh, official uh information around uh, about this um and the last thing to mention here today is that once the video call ends a survey will pop up and uh just to all the attendees uh takes only two minutes to fill in so we always appreciate feedback to the way we conduct our webinars um, because then we can do them better next time um, so once again uh, thank you Suzanne, Eileen, Simina thank you also Eric and Vladimir and thank you to all the listeners have a nice rest of the day bye bye, bye. Thank you.